All right, I'm showing 9 o'clock, so we're going to go ahead and get started. My name is Mike DeLaCluse, President of Lessman Instrument Company. I'd like to thank all of you for taking time out of your busy schedules to join us for Solenoid Valves 102, Valve Troubleshooting and Repair. ASCO Valves Mike Unterreiner is going to pick up where our Solenoid Valves 101 webinar left off with a deeper dive into valve types and a focus on valve installation, troubleshooting, and repair. In this 45-minute webinar, we're going to cover poppet and spool valves, internal versus external piloting, pilot valve mounting options, some installation tips, some valve maintenance and troubleshooting, and then at the end, we'll have a, a question and answer session. Mike is a senior process specialist at ASCO Valve. He's been active in valve instrumentation sales for the past 26 years and has been with ASCO for the last 10 years, serving various process markets including refining, chemical, grain processing, food, pharmaceutical, and power. We will be muting the phone lines. There is a question tool built in to GoToWebinar. If you would just type your question in, I will be monitoring it and we'll make sure that Mike uh, answers the questions. With that, I'll turn it over to you. Thank you, Mike. I appreciate it. Uh, again, as Mike mentioned, this presentation is a continuation of the one that uh, Bob Bullcrack did a few months ago. But I will be talking about new topics, as Mike mentioned, but also reviewing some that Bob covered. Again, those topics are uh, poppet versus spool valves, internal versus external piloting, pilot valve uh, mounting options, valve identification, installation, and maintenance and troubleshooting. So we'll start uh, with uh, three-way and four-way valves, pilot-operated valves, and we're going to go to uh, we're going to start with poppet valves. Um, as uh, Bob covered in the last presentations, you recall that solenoid valves are either pilot-operated or direct acting. Uh, direct acting meaning that um, the coil does all the work to open and close the valve whereas pilot operated or pilot assist valves, they need some differential pressure to make them operate. So again, we'll start with poppet valves. A poppet valve is a valve that is uh, controlled by the linear movement and contact of a blocking device with an orifice. So if you look inside uh, the internals of a poppet valve, you'll see it has a uh, the movable core that moves up and down when the coil is energized and that's attached to what we call the core disk, which in this, in this is uh, from the previous definition called a blocking device. And that blocking device controls the opening and closing of the pilot orifice you see there. And the pilot orifice opening and closing controls the up and down motion of, in this particular valve, the diaphragm. And the diaphragm moving up and down controls the main flow path of the valve to open and close the main flow path. So when you look at, there's a lot of different types of poppet valves, but they all basically operate on that same principle with a, um, with a pilot orifice and also a bleed orifice <coughs> that uh, controls the, uh, um, the inlet pressure when the valve is closed. So you'll see that uh, We've got some examples here of a three-quarter inch, uh, 316 uh, three-way valve with a brass body, which has a CV of 4.8. Uh, and then you'll see below that is an example of a quarter inch, a special one, a zero min 8316 valve uh, that I'll uh, talk about later. But that's uh, that has a CV of one and a half. Then uh, on the upper right-hand corner, we have a one inch 8344 series, which is a four-way valve which has a CV of uh, 5.2. And then the bottom right corner is a quarter inch uh, 8342 series, which is another three-way, which actually is that one particular one's an, an Nemur mount with a CV of uh, 0.7. And I'll talk about uh, Nemur mounting a little later. So next uh, I'll talk about spool valves. A spool valve is a um, uh, as a single moving part, the spool, that slides back and forth in a cylindrical passage. The spool is moved by pilot pressure from the solenoid operator. <clears throat> so it requires that, uh, again, it's a pilot assist valve where the, uh, the energizing and de-energizing of the coil 
pushes that spool to the right, and then there's a spring that pushes it back to the left. And uh, the common end exhaust ports are sealed off by the spool and the O-rings as the spool shifts, and certain other ports are opened and closed as, as they move. So if you look at the, um, the left-hand picture, when the valve is de-energized, you'll see that the uh, spool is shifted to the left, and the coil is, and spring is extended. And you have pressure flowing from the pressure port to cylinder port number one, and then cylinder port number two is exhausting out uh, exhaust port number two. And then when you energize the coil, the pilot pressure pushes that spool to the right and it compresses the little spring. And now you have uh, pressure flowing from the pressure port to cylinder port number two, and then cylinder port number one is exhausting out the other exhaust port, exhaust port number one. So that's, so if you, when you look at our ASCO catalog, you'll see that that's called a, a 5-2 valve or 5 slash 2, meaning a 5 ported 2 position valve. But it's a four-way valve in that it has two cylinder ports. So it would be typically used to control a double acting cylinder. Uh, in other words, uh, say C1 is pushing the cylinder um, to the left and C2 is pushing the cylinder to the right. So those uh, four-way valves are used to control uh, double acting cylinders. And here are some examples of, of different kinds of spool valves. You see the first one uh, up on the upper left-hand corner, a one-inch uh, 362 series. This is a, a new series of valves that we, we just introduced this past year. And that has a CV of 15 and a half. So you notice that's quite a bit more CV than, than we could get out of any of the, uh, uh, the poppet valves that I showed you previously. <clears throat> and when you look at the, um, the bottom left-hand corner, that's a quarter inch uh, 562 series, so that's actually a four-way stainless steel body valve. That particular one has a dual coil, so that one has, and that one has a CV of 2.0, even though it's only a quarter inch valve. The, the reason for the dual coil is to, if you ever want the valve to fail, <coughs> excuse me, to fail in last position, so if you lose power, the valve will just fail where it was last positioned. In a single coil valve, you always have that spring return, so it would return it to its um, original position. And then at the, uh, <coughs> excuse me, in the, uh, the upper right-hand corner, we have a quarter-inch 8551 series, which is a four-way stainless steel valve, and that one has a CV of uh, 0.86. And then you'll see on the bottom there, we have one of our quarter-inch 8551 series, um, which can be either three-way or a four-way uh, because it's an immer mount and it has that, uh, kind of hard to see there, but there's a little uh, uh, mounting uh, uh, flow, uh, a flow pad there that you can, you can change to either be a three-way or a four-way. And this particular one has an aluminum body and a compact coil. So that's a very inexpensive, um, spool valve, but you still get good flow with that. Again, the same as the one above, it's a, a CV of uh, 0.86, so that handles a lot of uh, smaller like ball valve and uh, butterfly valve applications. So when you look at poppet versus spool, there are different uh, strengths and weaknesses when you compare them. The, on a poppet valve, the strengths of a poppet valve are they're less sensitive to contamination not just contamination, but also, um, I mean, not just dirt and, and debris, but also moisture and water. They're less sensitive to that. They also have a wider range of sealing materials available than a spool valve, and a lot of them are able to handle liquids. Not all of them, but a, a good deal of them are able to handle <coughs> liquids. For example, that one valve I showed you, the four-way uh, Poppet 8344 series, that, is, that a lot of times is used in... Um, in uh, water plants to, uh, to actually shift large butterfly valves because they have a lot of water pressure and not so much, uh, you know, compressed air. Now the weaknesses of a uh, of a poppet valve are they're relatively low flow when you compare it to the body size of a uh, of a spool valve. They are typically more complicated and heavier in design than a spool valve, and typically you need higher powered coils than you would uh, with a spool valve. And so obviously when you look at the, the strengths and weaknesses of a spool valve, they're exactly the opposite. Uh, the strengths are they have high flow for a relatively compact body, 
and just relative and few moving parts, really just the spool moving. The weaknesses of a spool valve are generally uh, sticking problems when they lie dormant or idle for long periods of time, particularly if there's a lot of debris in there. And they are more sensitive to any kind of contamination than a poppet valve. So contamination, whether it whether it being um, um, you know actual dirt or pipe scale or anything like that, or also moisture that can get in there, uh, especially if it would turn to ice, that obviously is a big problem. And then uh, they have a, a less uh, limited range of sealing materials available compared to a poppet. So the next um, subject I'm going to talk about is uh, internally versus externally piloted valves. So on a, when you have a when you have a pilot operated or pilot assist valve, they can either be internally piloted or externally piloted. So let's look at an example of an internally piloted. Our standard 8316 series is a, uh, uh, a three-way valve with uh, pipe sizes from three inch up to one inch, and you can get uh, flow ranges of, of two and a half up to 12 and a half. Now this valve, you do need a minimum of 10 PSI to shift the valve. So when I say 10 PSI on a, on a three-way or four-way valve, I'm talking about the difference in pressure between the pressure port and the exhaust port. So if you look at the picture of the valve there, the, um, the, the left port there is the pressure port, and the right port is the exhaust port. The cylinder port's on the other side that you can't see. So that's where you need the differential pressure is between the, uh, the pressure port and the exhaust port. Now we make a special one of these 8316s called our Zero Min 8316. And if you look in our catalog, it has its own uh, catalog page called the Zero Min uh, page. And it's, it's, it's very close to the other one. We don't make it in as large of sizes, only quarter inch and half inch with CVs of 1.5 up to 4.0. Now, when this valve is internally piloted, it requires a minimum of 15 PSI between the exhaust port and the pressure port to shift it. Um, but you have the option of externally piloting this valve. And when you do that, um, then zero PSI is required flowing through the pressure port to actually have the valve shift. So when you look at the picture there, you'll see um, uh, there's an external pilot port on the opposite side of that neck. A little bit hard to see from that picture because it's on the opposite, opposite side. But that is just a little eighth-inch uh, port. And then on the, on the front side where you can see there, it shows a flow plate. That's where you actually change it from, from an internally to an externally piloted valve. Now you see at the bottom there, there's a chart. Um, we also need to worry when you when you are externally piloting a valve, you do need to worry about the minimum pilot pressure required. You can see here that uh, on this side of the graph is the uh, pilot pressure, and this side is called the mainline pressure. So that's the pressure throwing through through the um, through the pressure port of the valve. And you'll notice here that the pilot pressure always has to be higher. 15 pounds higher than um, the uh, than the mainline pressure, and that continues up on this graph. So you always got to be careful about that to make sure when you're externally piloting that you have enough um, have enough pressure, have enough pilot pressure. So when you look at that flow plate, all that is is a uh, it's uh, two screws with a cover, and you you can see the flow plate there. It just um, it's a holes with uh, with O rings on them. And when you flip that from internal to external piloting, what you're actually doing there is you're blocking the internal bleed hole of that valve. And then you're also, at the same time, opening up the um, flow path of that uh, external pilot port to actually pilot that valve. And when you do that, you the, the flow plate actually, instead of it being, uh, you see on the, on the side of the body, of the valve body there, it says, INT for internal or EXT for external. So when you flip that flow plate, it, it, it'll cover the one that you're not using and, and expose the one that you're using. So when you look at it, you can tell just by looking at the valve whether it's currently internally set up for internally or externally piloted. And then here's an example of uh, externally piloting. When, you know, when would you ever want to do that? 
Well, an example would be when you're doing a 3 to 15 PSI modulating valve. Uh, so that shows a, a big like globe type valve where you've got, uh, you can see the, the, the tubing is hooked up to the pressure port and that small eighth inch external pilot port. And then on the other side is where you've got your cylinder port where it flows the air to the actuator. So on this valve, you don't have to worry about, you know, even if, it, even if your pressure is only at, you know, 3 PSI, this valve is still going to work. Um, and you don't have to worry about uh, uh, not having enough minimum pressure. So this comes in handy in this particular application where you've got a 3 to 15 PSI modulating valve. And you want it to also be essentially like an emergency shutoff valve. So in an emergency, if you de-energize that solenoid valve, it would quickly dump the air out of that large actuator very quickly, as opposed to trying to do it, you know, through a through a positioner or an I2P, which would take much longer. So again, essentially, you can use a um, a modulating valve. It can double as an emergency shutoff valve, which in refineries and other places they do this quite a bit. Now. There are also uh, most um, oops, most valves uh, are not field changeable like that, like that zero min eighty three sixteen. Here shows a picture of our our new spool valves, whether they can be ordered or they they can only be ordered internally or externally piloted. They're not field changeable, and you can see on the on the left hand side that one has a little external pilot port on it. Uh, again, it's just an eighth inch port that's on basically the neck of the valve. Uh, that smaller one is an internally piloted one, and it does not have any uh, internally piloted ports. So again, it's not field changeable. And so most, um, most of our valves now are, are, are that way, where they can only be ordered either way and, and not field changeable. OK, the next subject I'm going to talk about is uh, uh, pilot valve mounting options. Um, I'm going to talk about four different kinds of uh, four different kinds of mounting. The first one is is conduit mounting, and uh, mm -hmm. you'll see there in the in the picture on the uh, on the left hand side, where that's again that's a stainless steel 8316 three way valve, and it's um, the conduit hub is mounted directly, a uh, nipple directly to the um, to a, a limit switch box, and so that's holding most of the weight. You'll also notice that on you can see a piece of tube there that's going to the um, that's on the other side of the valve where the cylinder port is where it's flowing to the actuator. So that also probably has some support there. So you can do conduit mounting uh, on valves that aren't too heavy, um, and and you've got a limit switch there to uh, directly uh, mount it to. And then another uh, popular style for mounting pilot valves is uh, uh, is pipe mounting them. So in the picture there, you see one of our um, 8344 series valves. And that's a kind of a particular kind of um, process valve. That's actually a big gas valve that, uh, that where you're tapping directly into the body of the valve to, to you know, shift the to shift, you know, solenoid valve is shifting pressure, um, where it uses the pressure on the, I should say, on the, uh, on the pipe directly on the valve body to shift the uh, big process valve. But there, you'll notice that really the only thing holding that valve in place, holding it, uh, holding it up, is the uh, the actual uh, tubing, the, the brass tubing there is holding it up. So there's other options. Um, probably the most popular option nowadays is is Nemur mounting, like the one on the left. You'll see it's um, shows a butterfly valve with a typical rack and pinion style actuator, and almost all manufacturers nowadays of rack and pinion style. Um, actuators, uh, pneumatic actuators, have a Nemur mounting pad on there. And then our valve, you'll see it mounts uh, uh, directly to it. It's because it's a standard type interface. Now, it, you have bolts that go through the body, and then you have O-rings or gaskets on the other side that um, that hold the flow in there without, without leaking. So that's probably the most inexpensive option for mounting, since it really has very little hardware required to do that. Um, other other options for for mounting uh, pilot valves are, are mounting brackets. You'll see that's uh, again that's an 8316. And if you get it with uh, with an MB option like mounting bracket at the end of the um, model code, it'll it'll come with those little mounting brackets, so you can 
you can basically surface mount that to any kind of surface that's you know close to your valve. And a lot of times they are mounted to like uh, mounting plates that are either bolted directly to a heavy valve or are bolted nearby. Now for, for heavier valves, uh, uh, for example, our new, our new 362, 562 spool valves that I've been showing you, they actually come with mounting holes uh, directly cast into the body of the valve. So since some of those valves are very heavy, um, and I don't know exactly how much, 20 pounds or more, some of the bigger ones, so you, you definitely, it would be difficult to mount those. You couldn't mount those to an actuator. Those would have to be mounted to some kind of a mounting plate separately from the actuator. So those come with big um, cast-in uh, mounting holes to mount, uh, to mount them you know, directly to some kind of a surface that's going to be nearby the, uh, the automated valve package. OK, so next I'm going to get into um, identification installation and troubleshooting. The first is, uh, you know, when you have a valve in the field and you, and you need to find out something on it, uh, the first place you want to look is, is the nameplate on top of the valve. Now this is a standard nameplate that we have on our, our Red Hat 2 series. And uh, we do have different um, uh, styles of uh, nameplates, but this is the, the most common one. You notice that it, there's the, the rebuild kit number is directly on there. So if the customer ever wants to rebuild it and they call you to order a kit, well, you can order it directly from, uh, from the rebuild kit number. It also gives you uh, the pressure ratings of the valve. So this particular valve, can you can either have uh, air or any kind of inert gas. You can run water through it, or you can even run light oil through it. So you'll notice that. Um, it says, for example, on the air, it says 5 to 200. So that means um, it, it can handle pressure between 5 and 200. And the reason it, there's a minimum there is because it is a pilot assist valve and that it has that minimum. So you need that minimum 5 PSI differential to make it operate. But then you also cannot go over the maximum of 200 for air. And then for water, you, you, you're not supposed to go over 150. And if you look on the other side for where it says light oil, it's uh, 135. So they're all a little bit different when it comes to the maximum pressures. <clears throat> Serial numbers are on the valves. So that can be important if there's ever an issue with the valve and um, uh, you need to track it by a serial number. The valve catalog number is at the bottom there. So for example, this is uh, an 8210G2, one of our most common uh, general purpose two-way valves. And then from that, you can get the catalog information, which I'll get to next. Uh, approvals are on the nameplate. So in this case, CSA or, or, or US. Um, enclosure types. So this is, a, this is a NEMA rating. So you can see this one's rated up to NEMA 4X, so watertight and dust tight and corrosion resistant. The, uh, the pipe rating uh, is, the, I mean, the pipe size is on there. So this is a half inch uh, pipe connection. Also, the date code is on there. So at least for ASCO, the date code, if it says 0418, that means that it was made in the year 2004 in the 18th week. So that can be important if um, you're just trying to get a general idea of how old that valve is. Uh, I mean, is it 10 years old? Is it 20 years old? You know, sometimes it's hard to tell when they're all grimy and they've been out there for a long time. Uh, the date code at least gives you some idea of how old the valve is. And then we also have the wattage of all the valves. So the, um, uh, you know, for example, depending on the voltage, you can get the wattage. <clears throat> now, when you look at the um, at the catalog pages, they give you a little bit more information than if you need a little more information than the nameplate. You can get that from the catalog pages. I know this this, this slide is hard to see here, but where I highlighted in yellow on the uh, on the right hand side, that that's that 8210G2. And so, for example, uh, some information that's on the catalog sheet that's not on the, uh, the nameplate would be like the CV, the flow factor. So it tells you, you know, how much flow in comparison to other valves you can get through there. Also can tell you the body material uh, of it, the, the wetted parts, you know, so if you're concerned that you're, um, you can see on the, uh, the left-hand side uh, where it says construction, it says, you know, uh, parts that are coming in contact with the fluid. So you can see, okay, if I order a brass valve, if I get NVR uh, or, or nitrile seals and, and stainless steel, other internals. So you can at least know, for example, 
is there anything in there that could be, um, you know, corrosive? I mean, there could be a problem with the fluid that I'm running through there. So the catalog sheets give you a little more information uh, in depth than the um, than the nameplate. Now on the, the coil, though, if you look on the back of our coils, that's the only place we actually put the voltages. Because and the reason being is because you can you can change out different voltages at least within the same AC. If it's AC, you can change out to different AC, or if it's DC, you can change out to different DC. So that's the back of the coil, and there you see the voltage there, and it says 12060 comma 11050. So that's that's our most standard type one, where it's good for both 12060 and 11050, and then we have the the CE uh, mark on there also. Now, when it comes to um, piping these valves up, you know, one thing we always tell uh, maintenance people is that, you know, be careful about how much uh, Teflon tape or pipe dope that you use when you're when you're installing these. Uh, and also with the Teflon tape, you don't want to put um, um, put it on the first few threads because that tends to shear off and then get inside the valve. And so debris in a solenoid valve causes a lot of havoc. And so, you know, we try to do anything we can to to avoid that. And also when you're in, installing one of these, you know, we always tell people to, um, you know, use the wrench flats that are that are built into the valve body. And uh, don't try to grab the coil, you know, the head, the coil, and kind of muscle it on there because that, if you bend internally what's called the core tube, that will damage, if that's even bent even slightly, the valve essentially will not work anymore and it's, you know, trash. So always be careful with the uh, how you install those. On on wiring, most of our valves are, are non-polarity sensitive. So they have two power wires, which are red, again, non-polarity sensitive, and one ground, a green wire. So it's hard to, you know, make a mistake there. Some of our valves are polarity sensitive, some of our low power ones, but uh, those are those are those are well marked on the uh, on the wires themselves. Yeah, as I mentioned earlier, contamination is the, the biggest problem that we have with um, with uh, with solenoid valves. Any type of contamination. And here it shows a giant rock, you know, a half inch rock, which is you know I I don't know how often a giant rock gets in there, but obviously that would be a problem, but it can be much, much smaller than that. I mean, even like little little pieces of pipe scale or pieces of Teflon tape getting in there can cause a lot of problems. You know, plugging up any of those internal orifices like the pilot orifice or the bleed orifice that, that I talked about earlier or just simply, um, you know, causing the, uh, the diaphragm not to shift. Anything, any type of debris can be a problem. But I always tell people if... Um, you know, if you have a solenoid valve that all of a sudden does stop working or is chattering, um, the first thing you should do is, if you can, uh, you know, depressurize it and then take it out of service and, and clean it and see if that works. Because in a pinch, if you don't, a lot of times there may not be an exact replacement sitting on the ch shelf that you can quickly swap it out. But if you if you clean it out, a lot of times the valve will work again. But we also recommend if, if it is an ongoing problem uh, with debris getting in the valve, we do recommend putting in filters or strainers in line with the valve to eliminate that problem. You know, again, especially if it's occurring over and over again. But, you know, with older valves, eventually the parts do wear out. And if, and if they look like one of these where obviously they're rusty or, or you know, a lot of um, uh, misaligned parts, you can rebuild the valves. So that rebuild kit that I, I showed you earlier, that's uh, the numbers on the uh, nameplate. That's what you get with, with our basic 8210 valve. So it's not just the soft parts on the inside and the, the movable core that you get and the springs, et cetera, but you also get a complete bonnet assembly, you know, which, which includes the core tube. So essentially that's really rebuilding that valve completely from scratch. So it, it's really everything except the, uh, the valve body and the coil. Now, not all of our valves, some, a lot of our valves are a lot more complicated than this one, and they don't include every single part, but they always include the uh, any kind of soft parts like the, the nitrile, buna, or Teflon, or whatever the soft parts are. Those are always included. And of course, you can, if something, if the coil does short out, uh, for example, you can replace coils. That's not a big deal. Um, so, you know, you can just buy a new coil, 
using the coil number on the, on the side of the coil itself. Uh, but it's just very important that you never exchange, interchange an AC for a DC or a DC for an AC. You can exchange different voltages of AC. You know, for example, if, if you had 120 AC and you wanted to use, say, 24 volts AC, you can do that, but you just can't interchange the AC for DC. Now, coil life is, is affected by a lot of things, but I would say most of the time it's usually ambient temperature around the valve. It's usually the culprit if, if you're seeing a lot of coil failures. But there are other, um, other causes, too. Uh, Overvoltage can, can cause a coil to fail, or if any of the parts are damaged or jammed, uh, they can do it. Uh, also, if there's, if, it's, if there's excessive pressure on the valve, say you're operating a little bit over the recommended pressure rating, that can cause it to, because um, the coil is having to work against that pressure, and uh, over time it would, it would cause it to fail prematurely. And again, of course, foreign matter in there causing it to, to clog up and having to work against that would cause a coil to fail early. So when you're, uh, if you're out in the field trying to troubleshoot a valve, um, two different uh, categories we have here. First on the top there is um, if a valve fails to shift to its energized position, um, could be several reasons. Could be either no or low voltage. I have seen low voltage uh, situations where the valve kind of chatters and doesn't quite shift correctly. Um, or obviously if the coil is burned out, if it's shorted out, it, it won't work. If there's too much pressure uh, acting against the coil to, to get it to the energized position. Or if you just have low flow or not enough uh, MOPD, which stands for that minimum operating pressure differential. So that was that differential I talked about with uh, when it comes to pilot assist valves. Uh, a jammed core could do that. A damaged disc or diaphragm inside of a valve could cause it uh, not to be able to shift to its energized position. The clogged pilot orifice is, a, is another thing that could cause it not to shift to its energized position. And if you're, uh, on the other hand, if you're looking at a valve that's not shifting to its de-energized position, that's, a, that's usually a different set of things to look out for. Um, if it's maybe a faulty control circuit in that um, you're actually getting some power there when you think you're not, uh, that's especially to be, you got to be careful when you're using any of our low power valves. Um, some of those don't require very much power at all to shift. Uh, and then, I mean, to, to be in their energized state. So when you go to de-energize them, if there's any leakage current or supervisory current, going through the system that could cause them to never de-energize and so they would never close, for example. Um, another thing to check out for is, 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 the, is, is the valve improperly installed. And when I say that, I mean the actual ports themselves. For example, on a, on a three-way valve, uh, on most of our three-way valves, say on 8320, the, the ports are marked uh, ports one, two, and three. So you have to know that uh, port 1 means pressure, port 2 means cylinder, and port 3 is the, um, is the exhaust port. So if anybody, if you pipe it up wrong, obviously it wouldn't, and it wouldn't, it would fail to shift to its proper energized position. Uh, scalar contamination can do that. Uh, any kind of damaged seat or disc. If, if the core is binding in the, in the middle, that could cause it to, to not be energized. Or if there's any kind of a damaged or missing spring, could cause it to not shift to its de-energized position. Or if that little bleed uh, orifice is clogged inside a pilot assist valve, that could cause it not to uh, shift to its de-energized position. Um, a, com a common problem we have with solenoid valves is what's called uh, uh, noisy valves uh, on AC valves. So this only happens with, with AC valves. And it's not, it's not the hum. I mean, it's normal for an AC valve to have a slight hum to it. And actually, some of the larger size ones, when you get up into the like the 20 watt or 30 or even 60 watt coils that we have, um, some of the AC hums can be rather noisy. But a noisy valve really is like a chatter. It's almost like a um, a large buzzing sound, like an old-fashioned electric buzzer. It's a really loud noise, and usually the culprit uh, when you hear a noise like that is it's foreign matter, you know, any kind of debris getting caught at the top of the core tube. Uh, and, what, and the reason is because AC valves have what's called a, a shading coil at the top that um, actually retains, some of, retains residual magnetism so that movable core 
makes a nice tight contact with the top of that cord tube. And if there's any kind of debris blocking that, it can't make good contact and just sits there and chatters forever. And that, of course, will cause premature failure of the valve. So if you ever have a customer with a really noisy valve, um, you know, that's usually the issue. Although I have seen also out there, I've seen some low voltage uh, cases where they weren't quite getting enough voltage to it, and it also made a loud chattering. And that also causes premature failure. So those are uh, two of the main things to, to look out for when it comes to really noisy or chattering valves. OK, that's it for my presentation. Um, Mike, if you want to open it up for questions. Mike, thank you very much. Uh, it is open for questions. There is a chat tool built into GoToWebinar. And I do not have any questions that have come in so far. But we'll, we'll give the audience a minute to uh, see if they have any questions. Uh, okay. I'm just trying to get that. OK, so I've got that tool up in front of me so that when a question does come in. Uh, Mike, thank you very much for the presentation. Uh, for, for the audience, uh, if you do have a question after we close the session, please feel free to send me an email at mikeD at lessman.com or call 809 Lessman, and somebody in Inside Sales or myself can certainly help you out. Uh, still waiting for questions, and we don't have any. Uh, if you want to know more about the technologies we supply, please follow us on social media. Uh, Dan Wisey, our technical specialist, has a blog, and he's very active with it with tons of great tips. Uh, all of our webinars are posted both on our website and at our Lessman Instrument Co. YouTube channel, so you can find them both on our website and on YouTube. Uh, if you want to know when something new is posted, uh, you can follow us on LinkedIn or Twitter. If there are some topics that you'd like us to cover in webinars, please send me an email uh, directly again to MikeDLessman.com with the subject. We have access to lots of good product specialists, uh, so please let me know if there's something that you'd like us to cover, and we'll work that into future webinars. Our next month webinar topic, topic is going to be deciding which topic to you, deciding which technology to use for liquid concentration measurements. And it's going to be presented by Kay Patton's Eric Kronowski. Uh, and it'll be on February 22nd at 9 AM. If you currently use Coriolis technology for density or concentration measurement, this, will, this is a webinar that you'll not want to miss, because it could save your plant some significant money by taking a look at Kay Patton's technology for measuring concentration. Uh, if you want more information on this, please go to our website. You can sign up in the Lessman Training Center. Mike, I still don't have any questions that have come in, so you must have done a great okay. job and answered all of them in the webinar itself. Uh, I, so. So it, uh, I, I do appreciate the opportunity. I thank you again. You bet. Thank you very much for putting it on. Uh, at this point, if you do have a question, please feel free to send it directly to me at MikeD at Lessman.com, and we'll get it answered for you. Mike, again, thank you very much. Uh, I still don't have any questions, so I think we can go ahead and conclude the webinar. Uh, enjoy your day.